going to go with cadmium red and some brilliant pink. Uh, brilliant pink is a color by Michael Harding. Uh, brilliant pink is a color by Michael Harding. And um, so I like to use Michael Harding oil paint because it doesn't have any, uh, any um, fillers. It just has the pigment and the binder. The binder in this case is a, a linseed oil, but there's no um, there's no fillers in Michael Harding. Also, no fillers in Old Holland. So if you're looking for uh, a good quality oil paint, uh, yeah, I would uh, I would go for that. So um, cadmium red is uh, is a really nice red to use as well. This one's also by Michael Harding. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I would recommend both of those, and then. Uh, what else? We're going to go with uh, just some titanium white. Uh, Colleen, thank you for saying that. Yeah, thanks very much. I appreciate that. So, um, we're going to work on these... Uh, little red fruit uh, down here kind of uh, they're called Kwandong and uh, they're native to Australia in fact everything in this painting will be um, from Australia and that's just because the um, the painting itself is going into an Australian gallery I'm uh, represented by a couple of different galleries but um, yeah this one's going into uh, a gallery in the Gold Coast of Australia, just north of Brisbane. So let's uh, let's see what we have here. This is this is cadmium red. And I'm going to put a bit of a shine on this one here. And I'm just mixing that cadmium red with some titanium white. I'll just follow it all the way around the edge of this fruit, which is, has been cut open. I'm not worrying about getting a ton of detail at this point. Just kind of uh, enough to know where the, the major colors are going to be. Do I always prep with a dark background? Yes. Yeah, I uh, I use black gesso. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so you can use. He just sent you seven hundred likes. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It's just Mason. Thank you for uh, tapping your uh, your finger and um, using up all of that uh, wrist uh, energy. Uh, or if you had an automated tapper, thank you for for doing that too. Um, yeah, so you, you most most of the time when you get gesso, it's white. I'd say well into the ninety percent. But but uh, there's also black gesso, which you can see is not actually black. It's a it's a mid gray, um, and it's really good for toning your can your canvas or in this case this is a panel wooden panel. And uh, when you when you use a, a mid tone, whether it's gray or burnt umber or raw sienna or some kind of mid tone. Um, it's much easier to judge values. So, do I use white charcoal? Uh, no, no, I use um, I use a colored pencil. Sometimes it's white, sometimes it's gray, but it's it's uh, something like this. This is a Prisma Color Premier, just a colored pencil. Um, I also have Faber Castell. Like I'm not really picky, and the only thing I I, I require for the for that underdrawing is that the colored pencil be um, be hard enough, I guess, that uh, it doesn't um, smudge or smear. See, you can't smear it. And then it's also, if it's too soft, that white powder from the pencil, if it's charcoal, for example, would come, would come off and go into your paint. You don't want that. So, um, 
can I teach you? Yeah, yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm hopefully um, here to answer questions. And if uh, you guys have any questions about oil painting and uh, or or art or being an artist, professional artist or anything like that, um, yeah, I'm here to answer uh, answer questions and share what knowledge I have. I mean, it's uh, not not uh, an exhaustive list, but it's picked up a few things, I guess, over the over my time. What's good? Yeah, how you doing? Go money. Almost looks like a chalkboard. Yeah, for sure. It's it's the same, basically the same colors. How did I begin selling work? Yeah, thanks for the question. That's that's one that I get a lot, and uh, I think that that's that's one that people are interested in when they when they start to when they've practiced enough art that they want to turn their um, hobbies into maybe more than a hobby, maybe a job. So um, you know, obviously, you can sell your work to uh, friends and family, and uh, you can kind of build a um, a group of support and some people are going to recommend you um, in that friends and family group to their friends and family, people you might not know, but maybe you're one degree of, uh, of knowing them, that sort of thing. But ultimately, you're going to want to sell, start selling your work to strangers. And uh, the best way to do that is to, well, uh, there are two different paths. Uh, what's my name? Uh, yeah, just check my, uh, it's, it's here in the profile picture. It's Mark Liam Smith. Um, yeah, so two different ways to sell your work. One would be um, just through yourself, and that would be through your social media channels, your website, and so on. And then the other way would be through somebody else, and that's, somebody else is typically a gallery. And um, But uh, it doesn't have to be a gallery. It could be an art consultant or uh, you know any uh, interior decorator or any other number of ways. But uh, if you're going to sell through a gallery, what you... you you can't just start with your dream gallery. They, they, uh, there aren't a lot of spots for artists. There are more artists than there are spots. So, in order to to start showing in a gallery, you're gonna you're gonna want to build up your exhibition history. And um, so, to build up your exhibition history, you're gonna start showing. You can you can choose for yourself, but something local something like a coffee shop or a library or maybe your town or city has an art fair that you can show at. Um, so you need to start building an exhibition history and then once it's large enough you might be able to get into a group show at an art gallery and uh, and that's a matter of you can do it two different ways. If you if you're the place you live is is small enough you can actually ask the gallerist but they tend not to like that very much. So I would probably recommend uh, applying to a group show. And uh, you can go on a website like Akimbo. It's spelled A-K-I-M-B-O. Akimbo. And they Akimbo is a list of all of the art galleries that are asking for open calls. And an open call is, a, is a, basically a competition where you would compete against other artists and usually the galleries have themes like it might be a portrait theme it might be a nature theme an abstract theme it might be a theme of winter or loss or love or you know anything any kind of theme is, is possible um, so these galleries they put on these shows basically to, to, make, to raise money because they might charge you 30 or 40 dollars to enter but then they get a thousand applicants you know, so they're making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars just on the application fee, um, and then they'll take the top hundred or something like that and have a group show, and then they'll sell the work and they split the profits with you, so they're making money again there too. So it's really good business for them to put on an open call, and that's why there are a lot of open calls. Um, so yeah, you can do some open calls, and then you start building up your exhibition history in art galleries. And once you get a good enough exhibition history in art galleries then some of those galleries might uh, start looking at your, at your work um, 
just sort of all the work that you've been built, building up. Uh, but you will need an exhibition history and you will need a whole body of work. So that means that you can't just have that one perfect painting that you made last summer. You need a whole body of work. And a body of work is typically anywhere from 15 to 20 paintings on a theme, on, a, on the same theme. The gallerist wants to know that your painting style has matured enough that it's, that it's um, consistent. You know, think about it like, um, like a, your favorite band. It's like your favorite band has a recognizable um, sound, even if their song, the lyrics are different, and if they're playing a, a fast song or a slow song, they're still very recognizable to them, or very recognizably them. Uh, so yeah, I would say, kind of fig figure that out. What is your voice? What is what is your theme? And then. Um, you're going to need 15 to 20 paintings, probably. Depends on the gallery. And, um, and then all the, all the while, if you, if you want to become a professional artist, like selling your work at an art gallery, you are going to have to, at some point, develop your social media. Because a lot of marketing through, from art galleries is through uh, social media these days. So, um, yeah. It's not, you can't just hope that the gallery has amazing marketing. You, you also have to. And, and the galleries, when they're choosing who to, who to uh, admit into their gallery, will, you know, whether it's right or wrong, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just telling you what they do. I'm not saying it's right. But galleries will look at your social media following um, because they're, what they're thinking is if a lot of people like you, then maybe a lot you have are you're going to bring a lot of collectors to their gallery. So you know, and again, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just that's the state of being right now in the art world. So um, yeah, and then you know, hopefully you'll get the attention of a of a gallery that way, and uh, you have your all your work ready, fifteen to twenty paintings, and and uh, and you'll have your exhibition history. Um, and then you'll be applying for different group shows from Akimbo and maybe one of those galleries that shows you will end up um, signing you and having you as a regular in some of those group shows and then from there they, uh, they'll add you to their roster of artists that's called a stable like a horse's stable and uh, once you get added to a stable you would be asked to um, sign a contract, basically. I wish I could send you a gift. Oh, thank you, um, Boss Semantic. Thank you for the rose. What medium am I using? Yeah, this is um, oil, oil paint. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of how it works. So hopefully, um, if you have any follow-up questions, just just ask. That's just, by the way, that's just one way to do it. There are many, many ways. There are as many ways as there are artists, really. And that's kind of the, that's the more maybe traditional way to do it. But, um, you know, I know, I know some people who have, um, they started by being street artists and they had no exhibition history, and but they became really popular as street artists, and then they um, they signed with a really good gallery right from the that's the very first gallery. Never did an open call, never did a group show, just basically signed with a good gallery. But you know that person built up a, a pretty substantial reputation as a street artist. So um, you uh, you know there's no there's no one way to to do it. There's no one right way to do it. You can just do what feels right to you. And, and you know, and also that's just, you don't even need to sell your art. Don't forget about that. There are lots of different ways to be an artist. You don't have to sell your art through a gallery. You can sell your art um, online. You can sell prints. You can sell your paintings through Etsy or through a, through a personal website. You don't have to do it that traditional, conventional way. Um, 
I think I'm going to pull in some magenta into uh, some of these just because I love magenta and uh, it's kind of a standard. All right, so here we are again with our Michael Harding. This is a brand from the United Kingdom. This is an oil paint, one of only two oil paints that I'm aware of that doesn't have any filler. So a lot of uh, brands of oil paint you'll find have filler. So they have, there are three things in oil paint, pigment, binder, and filler. Okay, pigment is the crushed rocks like this. This is a lapis lazuli rock. They crush it down so each particle is about 20 microns. And then the powder is suspended into linseed oil, cold pressed refined linseed oil. So those are the two things, pigment and um, binder. The third thing, but this Michael Harding doesn't have it, is called filler. And filler is either talc or wax or calcium carbonate or chalk. Um, and uh, that's used to dilute, and some would argue enhance, but I don't think so, um, to dilute the paint and make it cheaper. Um, but anyway, Michael Harding doesn't have any filler, and so the pigment load, how much pigment is in one tube, is very, very high. Anyway, this is magenta. This is a Series 3, so, you know, and they do last a long time. If you look, I bought this in uh, 2016, so that's five years old, and I've not even used half yet, so... You know, it is, it's about $40 for this tube, um, but that's five years. So let's assume I get another five out of it. 10 years, $40 is $4 a year. That's, uh, you know, that's 33 cents a month for the best magenta available uh, today. So uh, that's, that's a pretty good deal. 33 cents a month, I could do that. But, uh, you know, it is, it is a lot of money up front, so better as a holiday present or a birthday present or something like that. Um, yeah, thank you. How did I learn to draw? Okay, yeah, I can get into that. Uh, favorite YouTube song, With or Without You. Um, yeah, how did I learn to draw? I just kind of always drawn, I, I started with comic books way, way back um, when I was a kid, maybe 10, 11, 12, something like that. And, uh, but even before then, I, I, I've drawn, I've always loved having, you know, crayons or pencils uh, in my hand and, and uh, loved making things, creating things. So, yeah. I don't, um, I don't really have a good answer as to why, just it always was something I wanted to do. You thought it was Bono, my profile picture? Uh, no, that's a self-portrait, but, uh, but I do like you too, so. That would be funny though, for somebody to put somebody else in their profile picture. This is that amazing magenta. Uh, so that's it right out of the tube. Now watch what happens when I mix it with a little bit of titanium white. It is, uh, it's going to become almost neon. So here we go. The uh, style of oil painting that I'm doing right now is called Alla Prima, uh, and that's that's the technique where you deploy wet uh, paint on top of wet paint, and uh, this is this is a probably the fastest way to paint with oil paint. If you're interested in learning Alla Prima, I have just released a YouTube video specifically on this style of painting. It's called Alla Prima. Um, I, I also have. Uh, how to paint videos for beginners on other techniques like scumbling and glazing. The pigment's strong. Yeah, yeah, this is this is Michael Harding. Uh, Michael Harding pigment is 
Uh, I would I would say slightly better than Old Holland. Um, some could argue that, but uh, in terms of oil paint, it's either Michael Harding or Old Holland that are that are one and two. Um, and then at the third place is is quite distant. Um, who's my favorite artist? Oh, that's such a hard question. That's like that's like what's your favorite food? It's like well, it depends what the day is, what uh, what you're what you're hungry for. Um, so my favorite artist, some of my favorite contemporary artists were um, Chuck Close, Francis Bacon, uh, Lucian Freud. Some of my favorite non blue chip, like somebody who hasn't been at a Sotheby's or Christie's auction. Uh, I really like uh, Zachary Logan. He's from Saskatchewan. He's in his 40s. I really like Jen Mann. Uh, she's an incredible uh, figurative painter out of Toronto, Canada. I really like, uh, for abstract, I like a, a painter named Erin Lurie. And um, I also happen to know her. She's just incredible. She's also out of Toronto. Um, I like Keita Morimoto. He's now living back in Japan, but uh, his color use is incredible. Uh, there's a London painter named Andrew Salgado um, that uh, is doing really incredible things with color. Um, I like Andy Dixon's graphic style. I, uh, I really like how Jenny Seville shows the history of work. Yeah, I mean, they're just, they're just so many good painters, and there's no one way to do it right. Um, what size canvas am I using? Yeah, this is uh, 16 inches or 41 centimeters tall and 12 inches or 30 centimeters across. And it's not a canvas, this is actually a panel. Um, I'll show you what it looks like. It's a wooden panel, and then it comes with these boards. And it comes gessoed. This is white primer, but I've painted another coat of black gesso on top of it. Does paint canvas affect your pricing? Uh, no, just size. Size affects the pricing. What's my favorite brush type? Uh, I don't, I'm afraid I'm not very good with brushes. I tend to use very uh, inexpensive brushes. Um, like this brand, for example, is um, Royal Langnickel. This is the kind of brush that you get uh, 15 in a pack of uh, for 20 bucks and uh, I just when it comes to brushes I just want something that's not going to uh, shed hairs and um, yeah I uh, I tend it's kind of an artifact from when I was in art school you know I, I tended to spend all my money on pigment on paint and uh, I didn't really have much money left over for great quality brushes and I just kind of got used used to painting with less expensive brushes over the years so um yeah that's kind of where i'm at with that uh yeah i do have a reference so what i do my part of my my um, technique is i create my compositions on photoshop and then once it's finished in photoshop uh then i draw it out so that's why you see a grid here because that's where I wanted to get the proportions exactly right. So um, so I do have that Photoshop file um, that I can reference, but I don't like to reference it once it's drawn out because what happens is I don't want to just copy 
my reference, even if I put it all together myself, because then I won't be completely free to um, just use whatever color choices I want to use. And, um, also, you, you get inconsistent lighting that way too. I want to be able to light the whole thing exactly the, the way I want to um, from one direction and so on. And you develop a skill as well when you are when you um, you know use a reference at the start and then put it down kind of idea. So I just want to outline this with some maybe highlight colors here. Yeah, hello everyone, welcome, yeah. So this, uh, this oil painting is going to go to gallery in Australia when it's finished. I, uh, I'm also represented in Canada by Gallery Yoon in Montreal, but uh, they have, they currently have a solo show on right now uh, of my work until the end of January. So if you are in Montreal or if you know anyone in Montreal uh, and you'd like to check out my work, uh, yeah, you can check that out until the end of January. Um, that's in the old Montreal and down by the port. And that's Gallery Yoon, spelt Y-O-U-N. And uh, yeah, if you are in New York, you can, ch I have a show in New York right now. You can check that out. And that's Treat Gallery, T-R-E-A-T. -E and I'm showing some uh, digital photographs there. Oh, thanks so much. How do you approach a gallery for representation? Uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing you 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 sort of can't. Like there are technically there are a few galleries that that welcome submissions, but it's they're very very rare. It's almost like like it you know there aren't any. It's extremely rare because other then they would just get flooded, day and night with with uh, submissions. So um, how I did it was I, uh, I applied to a bunch of competitions on a website called Akimbo. And they have open calls and competitions and so on. And uh, so I would apply to these competitions uh, to build up my exhibition history. And, uh, you know, I got into a few and I, and I won a few as well. And I built up my, my exhibition history and I was able to... Um, some of those galleries asked asked me to show in group shows as well afterwards after the competition had finished and and those group shows end up you build up your exhibition history and then that turns into uh, other opportunities and that's kind of how it happened for me competitions but uh no your galleries tend not to appreciate you just uh, just approaching them These, uh, these kinds of fruit here are from Australia, and they, they're called kwandong. Uh, and uh, all of the fruit and flowers and the bird in this piece are all from Australia. I uh, wanted to have something 
very specifically for Australia since the painting is going to be shown there. It's going to live there. Are there any competitions you would recommend artists entering? Yeah, just go to Akimbo. It's a website. It's A K I M B O. Akimbo is the website that um, collects all of the competition data and open calls that different galleries are having and so on. So you can go there and check out all the different things that are available right now. Um, specifically, the really good ones are, um, it depends where you live. Like in Canada, the Kingston Prize is really great. Yeah, Kimbo, exactly. That's right. The Kingston Prize is really great in Canada, but it's every two years. The, um, the National Portrait Gallery in England used to put on a, a yearly contest. The problem with competitions is that the bigger they are, the, the more professionals are there competing. So sometimes what you're actually looking for, you know, if you're just starting out, you don't want to be applying to these really, really big ones because you might just, you're just wasting your money if you have to go up against people with 20 years of experience. Instead, if you apply for little galleries, a little gallery might be having a competition, like a local gallery. Remember, you just want to build up your exhibition history first. You're not going to be with your forever gallery right from the start. Just think about it like that. You're going to, you're going to have to build up to it. So, you know, it might be a coffee shop that you show in. Something like that. Um, you're just building up your, your, your history, your exhibition history. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, you know, take it slow. You have to think about it like, it's almost like, um, in the music world, you have a show is like an album, you know, you release your album. That's like having a show. And when you have that show, it's on the internet forever. So you kind of want to play a lot of songs before you release your album, so to speak. Get your ten thousand hours in, paint your, paint your, thousand bad paintings. You know, it depends how uh, how much of a rush you're in, but the more you can practice, the better. You're painting right now, but you've been depressed, and this paint is taking me so long. Yeah, sorry to hear that. It's, um, that's, I think, um, it's uh, important to remember that you can't always be at 100% all the time. You know, it's, it's uh, important to take breaks and, you know, just remember that you can't, you can't be always on. You have to uh, take care of yourself, take care of your health as well. And, uh, and eat right and get lots of sleep. It's, it's a difficult thing to paint. You have to, you know, you're, you're in a position for extended periods of time and you, um, you might be bending over, you might be moving your wrists and your fingers in unusual ways. Uh, depending if you're painting with toxic paint, it could be slightly unhealthy for you there too. So yeah, take care of yourself. If you're depressed, then, um, you know, you just take a break. Don't, uh, you don't have to force anything unless you're under some deadlines from a, if you've signed a contract kind of thing, but just take your time. It should be fun. It should be something you want to do. Yeah, hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to uh, another live stream. So... We uh, we finished painting an entire solo show over the course of I don't know nine months something like that, but the, I think the last I don't know I want to say seven paintings were done on uh, on TikTok Live, so that was fairly new for me because uh, I you know was not used to having an audience. get that 
but you become a challenge for what you create as you do it all the time. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, do I bounce around? Yeah, I do. I just, I, it's not really for a specific reason, just um, it might be I have a certain color on my brush right now and I want to use it all, or um, I have, uh, I tend to have, I, my, my brain tends to bounce around too, so I think it's easier for me to go there to there to there to there. Um, that keeps me stimulated more than just focusing on one small, small section the whole time. Um, that's just how my brain works. You, you might be different. You might uh, find a lot of peace from just going uh, just did to one area uh, until it's done and so on. I, uh, you know, it's again, there's no, there's no one right way to do it. But yeah, for me, I, I do bounce around. I have a hard time not bouncing. Where and when, I'm sorry, where and when did you start making art? Uh, I've always done drawing. I started drawing when I was a kid. I started drawing obsessively when I was about 10 or 11 years old with comic books. I would draw characters and, and make my own comics and so on. I didn't start painting until university. And I haven't painted professionally uh, until six years ago is when I started painting professionally. Uh, like, I mean, by professionally, I mean represented by art, by galleries and showing my work internationally and, and uh, you know, that sort of thing. I have a bit of an accent. Uh, well, everyone has an accent. But, um, yeah, I my accent is, I'm Canadian. So maybe that's what you're hearing. Um, I don't know what your what your frame of reference is. Uh, if you're American, you're probably hearing the Canadian. Uh, if you're Canadian and you have a very keen ear, then you might be hearing some British. I have uh, I moved to Canada when I was a small small boy, so I don't think I have a British accent on uh, underneath my Canadian. But I I just think I maybe overly articulate some words. But, uh, yeah, I mean, everyone has an accent. How do you prep for a solo show? How many pieces do you usually need? It depends on how big the gallery is. Uh, I, I, I paint. Typically, I, I write out my schedule, how many months I have before the show starts, and then I try to figure out how many paintings I can do. Um, and I try to make one or two more paintings than I need. And that way I don't have to include maybe a couple paintings didn't work or something like that. You want to have options. You don't want to have to include work that it maybe isn't your strongest. So um, depending on the size of the gallery, you probably for a solo show will need 15 paintings um, as a minimum and then upwards of you know as many as you as many as comfortably fit in the gallery my three solo shows with gallery Yoon have been 25 25 and 20 paintings so I think 20 is probably a, a fair number it's going to depend on how big they are that they are obviously and how you want to arrange them going to depend on your personal budget as well like if you want to frame them that could get very expensive if you have too many and so on um yeah just a lot of variables i would just as a as a rule i'd say probably at least 15 Always believe in your dreams and keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you. You too. It is uh, important to chase your dreams, whatever they might be. Just 
Your stuff's amazing. Thank you so much. You're Irish. Nice. I'm going to try to create a little bit of uh, reflected light here. So the idea is the light's coming in from this angle, this angle here. And it's going to hit this one and then bounce up against this side. So orange is a very nice uh, color to, to show reflected light uh, from red. Uh, and the reason for that is that they are analogous colors. It means they're right beside each other on the color wheel. And so if you have a red base already and then you mix a little bit of orange on top of it, like I'm doing right now, then it will simulate reflected light. And um, kind of give your, give your object a little bit of a shine. <clears throat> What would you recommend for somebody looking to work up to being a professional artist? Um, there are so many different aspects to, to uh, what you need. If you're going to be a professional artist, you need to be able to make the art very well and consistently, consistent enough that you can have you know, a show every year and a half or two years. Um, you also need to be uh, on top of your social media, art galleries, uh, more and more asking artists to, um, do the, do a lot of the marketing through their own social media channels. So you'll have to, uh. If you don't have a strong social media presence, that's something that you can work on while you're working on your show to, uh, to show people. Because it will be, it, it is a, it's, not a, it's not a necessity, but it's a very nice to have. It just it makes you uh, very attractive to galleries if you have a stronger social media presence. Um, obviously, you need the work. You have to practice a lot to find your style. Um, once you have a consistent style, then uh, yeah, you just keep going and keep keep developing it. I think clear goals, uh, create a roadmap. Don't. Don't look at the end game uh, as your goal. Try to try to create a roadmap. So, you know, with reasonable goals too. Maybe, maybe you have a goal of showing in a coffee shop in the next three months. I think that would be a good goal. If you've never shown any before, if you've never had any exhibition history, um, depending on the size of the place you live, um, there might be a coffee shop that does show some art. You might just ask them, hey, is there any way I can um, show some of my art, maybe five or six pieces here uh, for three weeks, something like that. Something that would be very hard for somebody to say no to. And uh, and usually the coffee shops are really great. They won't even split, split the profits. They'll just give you the profits. And um, yeah, and, and once you do that, then you start kind of start collecting your collectors is the idea. Um, and people who believe not just in your art, but also in, in you and in, in what you're trying to achieve and your, your dream and your vision. Um, after a few coffee shop shows, I think you're probably ready for a, uh, a gallery group exhibition and with maybe one or two or three pieces. And uh, you can approach local galleries, but uh, more than likely you'll have to just go to something like a Kimbo and then uh, 
yeah, hopefully get in, get into a few different group group shows and just keep doing that until something kind of sticks. And then you'll get a one of the we'll get one of those galleries that gave you a group show. We'll we'll want to uh, give you something more, hopefully. What's my favorite sport? Oh, I don't know. I tended to uh, just to like the sports that my brother played in. So I was mostly basketball and football. But I'm not very sporty. I can I can really tell you. I can probably tell you the names of the teams, but I can't really tell you who who's playing on those teams. What's my project here? Uh, this is a painting I'm doing for a gallery in Australia. Um, they represent me and uh, they've sold a few paintings of mine. So I'm looking just to replenish their stocks um, they're very patient with me. I, I was painting a solo show for a different gallery, so I hadn't uh, given the Australian gallery a painting in a very long time. So, um, Okay, so this one over here, there's another Kwandong over here. This is going to be kind of uh, in the shadows, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to do very much detail at all. I'm just going to kind of scrub it in. Yeah, three is awesome. Such a good age. I mean, every, really, every age is is amazing, and it's uh, I only I just have the one. But uh, there you go. Every age has its has its uh, high points. They teach you a lot about yourself. while you're trying to teach them about life. So, uh, yeah, it's a real it's a real privilege to be his dad. We'll move over to this one now. So these are all basically red, but the problem is if you just use red, they're gonna it's gonna look too flat. So that's why I'm I'm using a little bit of pink, a little bit of orange, a little bit of magenta, and just kind of mixing up the reds. There's no uh, there's no specific reason to do that other than uh, I I just don't I don't want the whole thing to to be too flat. So it's not like they're different colors in real life or anything. I'm, Just a kind of a hack, a cheat code. Make them all slightly different. And that way they can stand out from each other. Does he take after me in creativity? Uh, yeah, he's very creative. Um, linguistically, he's he's very creative He uh, as well, but um, I... I didn't let him do any painting until he turned two. Uh, but before that, it was just uh, colored pencils and and uh, pencils and so on. But uh, but when he turned two, I started to let him paint. And yeah, he's he's has produced some amazing paintings. Uh, they're on my Instagram if you're interested in checking them out. And uh, it's I guess what I would call uh, intuitive abstract. But what's really amazing about them is that there's no ego in them. He's not trying to paint anything. He's not trying to impress anyone. It's it's just just raw mark making, color application, texture, and mark making. It's it's really amazing to watch him paint. So um, yeah.
Am I using a board? Uh, yeah, this is a this is a, this is called a panel. Uh, so it's it's a board that ha has uh, width, which is see it's just pieces of wood here. There's four pieces of wood, and then this is a panel. You can buy these at art stores, and they come pre gesso. See that white? That's gesso. And then I paint over the whole thing with black gesso, um, and then and then draw it out. Draw on top of that with a white um, colored pencil, like a, like this, like a Prisma Color Premier. It's a colored pencil. It doesn't uh, blur. That's why I like it. it. Doesn't smudge. Doesn't affect my colors. Yeah. Yeah, it's oil paint, Connie. Um, yeah. By the way, to everyone, if you are interested in, in painting, if you're just starting out or, or maybe you're about to start out, maybe you've asked for some oil paints uh, for, for the holidays, um, I do have a YouTube channel and I have a whole series on there specifically designed for new painters. So if, uh, yeah, if you're interested at all, please do check that out. Uh, I, I talk about brush shapes like fan and angled and filbert and bright and flat and round and what they do, uh, when to use them, how to use them. Um, that's on one video. Another video I talk about oil paint, natural versus synthetic, student versus professional grade, best paints overall, best paints for a budget. I go through all different kinds of things there. Um, I have another video on supports like this. What's the advantage of panel? What, what about canvas? What about paper? All up and down on that. Then I get into paint application, like scumbling and glazing and ala prima. Um, and then, you know, there's color theory stuff and so on and so on. So, yeah, please do, please do check that out if you're interested. Uh, hi, Kim. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the same technique. Uh, I do have a reference, yes, is the answer. Um, so I make my own reference. Um, it's the same technique as, as uh, last, my last show. I make my own reference images um, by cutting out parts of many different pieces. Um, so the fruit will be from uh, two or three different images and the bird from a different one and the flowers, and all different ones. And then I make the whole thing on Photoshop. Um, and then I have that Photoshop reference that I draw the whole thing. Um, and then with that reference, I always have it on hand and I can use it at any time, the, uh, the, the photoshopped image. Uh, however, I don't like to look at it uh, because I find that when I do look at it, I, I, mean, I limit my choices uh, in terms of my color choices. My, um, I would Maybe I would do something, but then I'm stopped from doing it if I look at the reference and so on. So... Um, yeah, so the answer is yes, I have one. I use it heavily to draw to draw out my image. I make it myself, but then I try not to use it while I'm painting. Uh, yeah, thanks. My, uh, my YouTube name is Mark Liam Smith. Uh, same as my TikTok name. And um, uh, that's actually my, my username on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, just all of, uh, all of my... Uh, social media yeah you're welcome Kim um, by the way everyone if you uh, if you do want any art for the holidays um, I think if it's not too late already it's probably today or tomorrow the last day to order anything from my store to in order to get it in time um, you know obviously depending on where you live but um, I, uh, my online store is markliamsmith.com. There's a link in my bio here if you're interested. And um, I sell prints uh, starting at 25 bucks. And uh, the prints are the, exactly the same size for most of them. I think there might be one or two that's not, but the same size as, as my paintings. So like this one is, is um, 30 centimeters by 41 centimeters or 12 inches by 16 inches. Um, and and so, yeah, you can you can check those out if you're interested. Um, I have over forty different paintings that I've made into prints, 
uh, on on my uh, online store. So. And there's my shameless plug finished. That's okay. It's like a commercial. Is the front one a pomegranate? Uh, no. So they are, it's a kind of a very small fruit called a kwandong. Uh, Q-U-A-N-D-O-N-G. And uh, this fruit is native to Australia. Um, that it's, it's the same coloring and that end part is very much like a pomegranate, but the pomegranate would be, a, you know, that big. But uh, yeah, I t completely, I can see why you'd, uh, why you'd say that. It's definitely um, in that family. Uh, yeah, hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, Australia. I mean, it makes sense that Australia has fruit that, that we don't have in North America because they have uh, animals that we don't have anywhere else and they have plants that we don't have anywhere, that um, that can't be found anywhere else in the world. So, uh, yeah, Kwandong. I never heard of it before. I started to do research for this piece, for this painting. Um, but I certainly would like to try one, maybe one day. I will have an opportunity to uh, to go to Australia and see that gallery. It's adding some highlights here. Been there before it's wonderful yeah i like to go how did i get connected with the gallery there uh they found me on instagram that was um maybe four or five years ago something like that and uh yeah found me on instagram we started a conversation uh, I showed with them for a couple of years and then I stopped showing with them and then I started again in 2020. Because, um, when I first started showing with them, I was showing uh, portraits. And, um, it was maybe 2016 or something like that when I just, I just started painting. It's pulpy. Yeah. I think I'd like to try it at least once. It's so strange coming across uh, fruit that you've never seen before. It's, uh... And I went to South America for the first time. I encountered all kinds of fruit. 
I don't even know the names, the uh, English equivalent. So, amazing. Kind of amazing how much different fruit there is, different kinds. darken this a little bit more. You create uh, meaning in painting through contrast. So by darkening this, then the highlights will appear brighter by contrast. Um, Much more than strawberries and grapes. Yeah, yeah, I know, I hear you. I was uh, apples, oranges, and bananas. I was kind of, you know, you see some grapes every now and then in grocery stores, but those three, three main ones. Do I make prints of my art? Do I sell my originals to make room to make more art? Uh, yes, yeah, both, Connie. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, I sell originals. I have over 40, uh, sorry, prints. Yes, I sell prints. I have over 40 prints available um, right now on my online store. A, there's a link in my bio or you can go to markliamsmith.com. I have, uh, and they start at 25 bucks and go up from there. I'd say 90% of them are are 25 or 40 bucks. And then I have a few really big ones for 60. Um, maybe one for 80, like a really big one. But um, yeah, most of them are 25 or $40. And then uh, for the originals, original paintings, I sell through three different galleries. Uh, Gallery Yoon in Montreal, 19 Karen Contemporary in uh, Mermaid Beach in the Gold Coast of Australia, and Rouge Gallery in Western Canada. And, uh, and then I also sell digital photography manipulated through Photoshop um, a, with a New York gallery called Treat Gallery and I have a show on right now as a matter of fact with Treat Gallery um, and with Gallery Yoon. I have a solo show with Gallery Yoon for original paintings um, all the way through January 29th. So uh, thank you for asking. Yes, the answer is yes to both. I try to sell my originals and I so, prints. I'm going to add some orange to the inside here, and it's going to give the illusion of a increased transparency, like there's some, it's a thinner wall. Orange to the brain reads like red with a lot of light on it. So you can kind of trick the audience that way. How do I get prints made? Uh, I have a, a third party, it's a um, back-end supplier that does my um, fulfillment. So they do the production and the shipping and all of that stuff. So I don't, I have more time to focus on, on painting. Um, that's the idea. But I know some people that go to professional printers and work with print shops and um, kind of do it that way. There's no one right way to do it. Just depends on how you want to divide your your hours of the day. Everyone gets the same number of hours, but uh, how how you want to use yours is entirely up to you.
find a cheaper route when it comes to getting prints made. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I hear you. It's always about balancing that. The very first prints I had made um, cost $100 each to make. And so, and the gallery made made them. And so we ended up charging $300 for them. And um, they weren't as popular because that's a lot of money for a print. So if you can decrease the production costs and the shipping costs, then you can decrease the price as well. So that's why something like a back-end supplier might be a good option if you have a website already and if you have a lot of work and so on. So, yeah, it's, it's it was too pricey. Hmm, maybe that's a little too bright for what I'm thinking. I mean, they were amazing, though. They were um, museum quality. It's like the best possible print you could possibly make kind of idea. Um, but pricey. I mean, it's the kind of print that you would see in a gallery, basically. Not, uh, not the kind of print that you would expect coming from a, a website. Do I finish the fruit before I go on to the next one? Uh, not necessarily. Um, I, I am doing it this way because I'm resting my hand on the painting. Um, I, I have one of those sticks that I can I can rest my hand on the stick, but then my left hand is committed to holding the stick. So if I just paint left to right, um, then I can rest my hand on the, on the painting. So I do prefer that. And then, but no, I don't necessarily have to paint one at a time. I can kind of bounce around. Um, but I will finish all of the fruit before I move on to something else be, um, because I don't want to waste paint. I I just want to do I just want to do the reds um, first, and like I might do the red in this bird here. Um, but I don't want to waste paint, so I'll do all my red first and then do something else because there's no point in, in doing a full palette if I'm not going to be using green for the next four or five days. Um, you know, it's just going to be sitting there drying, so. That's that's a waste of paint for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, uh, that's a good point, Kim. Those are uh, excellent prints for sure. Um, archival ink, usually the paper for a G clay, depending on where you go. Like, uh, so I'm I'm in Toronto, just outside Toronto. I would go to somewhere like um, where that first that first set I went to a place called Toronto Image Works, and uh, they would use um, you know, ar archival ink. They would use um, uh, Hanamula rag paper, which is again just it's acid free, it doesn't yellow over time, uh, just just uh, extremely high quality uh, paint um, uh, print material, so museum level. And, uh, but again, when you're spending that much money to make your print, you, you obviously have to charge more than you spent. And hopefully you want to make a profit if you're, if you're trying to be a professional artist, you're going to have bills still. So you have to try to pay for those bills somehow, but, um, yeah. But you're right, your, uh, your G Clay prints are quite good.
Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. So I have a bunch of different uh, kinds of reds here. A lot of uh, red family going on. I have cadmium red. I have cadmium orange. I have magenta. I have a color called brilliant pink. Uh, and then I also have black and white so that I can create tones and shades of each of those colors. What else am I going to do? I'm going to keep painting these guandongs, and then I'm gonna paint this large flower, and I'm gonna paint those little yellow flowers, and then I'm gonna paint that finch, and then I'm gonna paint the background, um, and then I'm gonna do another one after that, and then I'll do another one after that. Yeah, that's my plan. I'm gonna be taking uh, a little break from lives from for about 10 days uh, as I go visit my family in Western Canada over the holidays. So that'll be nice. I haven't uh, been out West since COVID started, so it'll be really good. Hi. Um, yeah, let's move on to the next one. I think I'll just knock this back a little bit more before I move on to the next one. bumpy inside there so I don't want to make it too smooth. I want to try to imply that texture or at least put enough down on the painting so that um, so that you will imply the texture. That's that's the goal. That's what I'm really after. But I haven't shown you the palette yet. Why don't we have a look at that? Well, these are the colors that I'm using for these Guangdongs. We have Mars Black here. Mars Black. This is Cadmium Red. These are all Michael Harding paints, by the way. This is Cadmium Orange. This is a color called Brilliant Pink. Uh, and this is Magenta and then titanium white. 
Uh, and of course I have linseed oil that I'm using. I'm not using any solvents like uh, odorless mineral spirits or turpentine or turpenoid and so on. I'm not using anything like that at this point because I'm painting alla prima. I'm not glazing. Once uh, the paint has completely dried, I then have an option to either scumble or glaze, um, but I but it, you can't do either scumbling or glazing uh, until the paint the, the until you have at least one color down. So that doesn't qualify because there are no colors down, and that doesn't qualify because even though it's a color, it's not dry. You need at least one dry color in order to scumble or to glaze, um, and that reminds me that uh, I just posted another video on my YouTube channel today um, about Alla Prima painting, the style of painting that I'm doing right now. So if you are uh, new to painting and you're interested in Alla Prima, uh, I will direct you to that painting tutorial. Um, I talk about what it is and how to do it and how it can help your painting. And uh, so I'm uh, such a huge fan of Alla Prima. I think it saves a lot of time. I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a very efficient way to paint. Uh, and then you still have so many options in terms of the uh, scumbling or glazing afterwards as well. It's just, uh, it's a great start to a painting and, and, uh, and you can leave it there. You don't have to then go ahead and scumble or glaze. Um, but I really think it's uh, an advantage to mix right on the, on the canvas as opposed to mixing on the on the palette but um, as I as I have said before and will keep saying there is no one correct way to paint you kind of have to find what works for you um, and what's the most important thing is that you find a way of painting that appeals to you know that, that you're happy doing that you want to do as soon as painting becomes a chore then uh, then you need to change your style. You need to paint a different way because it should not be a chore. Even if it's your full-time job, um, you should you should like it. it may, maybe just means you're doing either the wrong st style of painting or maybe your content needs to be changed up. If you're a portrait painter, maybe you should try abstract or landscape or still life. This is a tricky passage here because it needs to be dark enough here to appear behind this, but light enough here to appear to be in front of that. Uh, so the rule is the lighter things appear forward and darker things push back. And then also there are other ways to do that as well. Desaturated falls back, saturated comes forward, detail comes forward, general goes back, um, small comes forward, large goes back. There are all kinds of... Um, secrets to painting that uh, that you you should keep in mind when you're when you're doing your piece so if I want to push something back you know make it recede then I can deploy a number of different techniques or methods but um, you should at least have as many tools in your arsenal as as you can it doesn't mean you have to use them all every painting but it certainly is nice to have them if you need them um, and you never know when you will need them
you really don't require much oil paint to get coverage. Um, certainly, if this were acrylic painting, I would need a lot more uh, paint. And then the other thing too is when you use professional grade paint, um, you don't have to go over things a whole bunch of times. You can, the, uh, the paint has enough pigment in it that uh, you, get, you can do the thing that you're trying to do the first time around. So, just adding this uh, shine here. And this is just titanium white on my brush, but I'm mixing it in with the cadmium red that's already on the painting. Uh, and that technique is, again, this is Alla Prima. Uh, the reason why I keep talking about Alla Prima is that I just posted that Alla Prima painting video to my YouTube channel. You can check it out at markliamsmith.com. Uh, Sorry, um, just Mark Liam Smith in the, in the Google search. Uh, markliamsmith.com is my website. Um, yeah, you can check out Alla Prima. Uh, I just posted it today if you're interested in learning how to paint uh, this technique that I'm doing right here. Akira, yeah, thanks for coming by. Lagneto, thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Let me go for a little bit of magenta in this stem here. I'm kind of using magenta here as a, uh, you know, in order to value shift for my cadmium red. Cadmium red t red tends to be sort of in that five six area. It's a pretty mid valued red, and um, but uh, magenta right out of the tube is has a slightly lower value. Um, I, I'm not talking about worth when I say value. I'm talking about a scale. It's called value. Some people call it tone, but really it, it is called value. And that's, uh, you know, one being white and 10 being black, where uh, on that gray scale, if you looked at the color as though it were an achromatic gray, what value would you give to it on that gray scale? So that's, that's what value is. And uh, it 
it's every color has an innate value. Some are lighter and some are darker. And uh, so, for example, yellow is the lightest, and, uh, and then it goes to orange. And then green and red are tied, and then blue is slightly darker, and then lastly, purple is the darkest color in terms of value. kind of wrinkling going on here. Uh, thank you so much. Do I offer classes uh, just on TikTok and YouTube? Um, but uh, no, I mean, I have, I have uh, done some zoom private uh, tutoring before but no i don't have anything formal kind of set up i have um, a couple of different companies have approached me to teach for them but i haven't uh, i haven't done anything with that i haven't signed anything or i don't have anything any plans so for now my lessons are free on youtube and free on tiktok This, uh, this particular Guangdong here that I'm painting um, reminds me a lot of when I painted a pepper. There's a lot of the same kind of uh, textures. I had a lot of fun painting that pepper. I should do some more pepper painting. Like, like chili pepper, hot peppers. I've only ever painted painted peppers once, but I think maybe I'll, my next painting after this, I'll put some hot peppers in there, like like the really hot ones, Carolina Reaper, Scorpion Pepper, um, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, Seven Pot Pepper. Moving along, getting there. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine more. Lost ten, I guess ten more. I won't get through them all today, but um, maybe get through a few more for sure. Um, this one is a little bit more central. I think I'm, I'll go with some more oranges and uh, kind of in that orangey red area, not so much the magenta red zone that I have been in on those uh, other ones. Let's give it a shot. So I'm going to go brightest most chromatic area here it's closer and then so as the as the guandong rolls back that way and under uh, i'm going to have to make some adjustments to show those reflections in in um, distance and same thing around you, you have to show change through um through a change in in color or saturation. So we'll go with this 
red here. As long as it's sufficiently different and it's not different enough, so I'm gonna have to go right to something really drastic, really dark. Um, and I'm just gonna do a, you know, like almost like a graphic line. Just kind of hope for the best that that's gonna read like a shadow. But I need to separate those. I'm just gonna kick that orange back a little bit with uh, with some pink here. Still gonna keep the chroma quite high. So really visually quite rich to have this much red. It's unusual to have this much red. You really shouldn't be doing that, but um, if you have a lot of red, they can kind of cancel each other out. Just a little bit of red is much more powerful than a lot of red. is a round object so I'm gonna to have to round it off at the bottom here I've just added a little bit of black to my cadmium red now generally speaking when you add black to cadmium red black is fundamentally a cool color because it has so much blue in it, it has 50% blue in it well 50% cyan technically 30% um, uh, magenta and 20% yellow that's black. So black is fundamentally a, a, a cool color. And when you mix warms and cools, the result is a desaturated product. Um, but in this case, since the red is so powerful, this cadmium red, I, ca I can get away with adding a little bit of black to it uh, and have it still retain that extremely high chroma. Magenta now. Okay. Yeah, I'm the same thing with the stem here. Thank you so much for everyone who is uh, tapping the screen and uh, sending me likes. I do appreciate that. We are at 9.5 thousand likes. So thank you very much.
so excited to you um, get to use my Christmas present. Uh, I, I got to open it early, um, so that was very nice. My wife bought me my dream colored pencil set. So you know, I've been drawing my whole life. Um, and even as an adult, I've all, every, every time I go into an art store, I go over to the colored pencils. In Canada, we call them pencil crayons, but um, I know most of the world calls them colored pencils. So um, go over to the colored pencil section and I stare at this one set of colored pencils. It's, it's the, uh, the Cadillac, I guess is how they say it, or the, the Rolls Royce, right? It's the Rolls Royce of, of colored pencils. So my wife uh, bought them for me this year. I'm so excited. I've used them a few times already, but uh, I'm gonna be doing a lot more colored drawings in the new year because I have this amazing set. Would you like to see them? I will show you what they look like. So this uh, Faber-Castell is the maker. And so the best um, pencil, color pencil company. Um, so this is the brand, the Polychromos. Color pencils. This is the 120. This is their biggest set, um, and it's, so they're just amazing. Um, so it opens up, and there are three levels. So that's the first level. With uh, from white going through all the warm colors, basically, and then the second level is the cool colors. So you have blues and greens, and then some browns here. And then this last level, you have a full range of grays and some metallics um, and sort of beiges and so on. So yeah, that's the set. And, and with this particular brand, the Polychromos brand from Faber-Castell, um, it's their professional grade. So these are the ones that are the highest uh, pigment load. Um, when you, I mean, I'm in Canada and this, uh, this set happened to be on sale. So I got it for nearly half price. It was just the best to be able to get that for half price. Because yeah, it's always just been too expensive. It's just outside my range, what, uh, what I can reasonably expect to spend on art supplies. But when I saw it for half price, I just, I, I was very excited. Yeah, hard pass dolls are good too. Um, Saint-Nellier is a really good brand for pastels. I don't know what kind you have, but, um, yeah, you can get oil-based pastels and you can get chalk-based pastels, so, but, um, yeah, pastels are good, really nice for drawing.
Karandash. I don't know what that means. Is that a brand? Which am I using? Uh, I, I don't use pastels. I, uh, I, right now I'm using, this is oil paint. And I'm, I'm using Michael Harding. Excuse me, I'm using Michael Harding oil paint. Historically, I have used pastels. I've used a bunch of different kinds. Um, but uh, I found that Sennelier was the... Let me see. There's a here, actually. This, uh, this is uh, the brand, Sennelier. Um, and they look like this. They're very, uh, so these are oil, oil based. And you can, um, so you can use them, you color with them, and then you can also um, apply um, linseed oil as well and a brush and you can brush afterwards so yeah these are these are really fun to use uh, excellent pigment load so this this set comes with a couple of different layers um, but uh, no i don't have a lot of experience with oil pastels or chalk pastels for that matter. I don't have a lot of experience. I'm, I'm more about the drawing with uh, color pencils and then just regular graphite. But, um, you know, it's always, it's one of those things that's sort of on the list. And uh, I always tell myself that I'll start doing some of those side projects once I get my show out of the way and then Get another show. Putting some highlights in here. To kind of give the illusion of this being be a little shiny. What's the difference between a white underground, uh, like the the background? Yeah, so. What happens is when you buy a, a canvas or a panel from the store, they'll they, it's they start you off white, um, and that's so that you can paint your own ground. Um, and most people will do a if in a, if they're academically trained, they'll they'll do a burnt umber or a raw sienna, um, and you tone your canvas so you go the over the whole over the whole white canvas with a, basically a light brown or a reddish brown um, that's very, very diluted. with, uh, And then you would dilute it with something like um, terpenoid or, or you know, solvent of some kind. Uh, and then you let it dry and, uh, and then you, you kind of, and then you do your painting from there. You would do, your, do a charcoal drawing on top of that and then start building up the value with a, something called a grisale or a dead layer. And then finally you start applying color. That's the uh, the more academic or traditional way to do it. Um, so I kind of skip a few steps. Instead of going for the white um, canvas and then toning it, I go with black gesso instead of white gesso. <coughs> Excuse me. I go with white gesso instead of black gesso. And um, because you can see it doesn't dry black it dries dark gray, so it's like a mid-tone. And the reason why you want to do that instead of painting on white, you don't want to paint on white, you want to paint on something, something mid-tone, whether it's umber or sienna or, or in this case, gray. You want to because it's easier to judge value relationships if you don't have a glaring white background. It's like, um, it's like staring into headlights or something. It's uh, harder to judge what's going on if you have this white background. So it's, uh, it's a good idea to either, you know, if you have an art professor, they'll always tell you, um, cover the whole canvas first. Don't get bogged down on details and so on. Um, 
uh, but yeah, cover the whole canvas first because it, you, it's really hard to to judge value yeah, if you have a bunch of white around it. Where are the origins accepted, uh, John, from? Yeah, so I think they come from the 1600s. You could, you could certainly make an argument that they started before that. You could probably argue that it went back to the Renaissance. So maybe, maybe get away with 100 years before, 1500s. But I would argue probably they started um, in maybe 1620, 1630. At that time, basically, there was a pause and there was a major war raging in Europe at that time and uh, between the, uh, the Catholics and the Protestants, basically. Spain fighting for domination all over all of Europe and uh, the, the, uh, what's in modern day Holland was really affected by that war. But there was a pause in the war for about 10 years and, uh, and at that time, you saw a lot of the studios in Spain and in Italy and, and in the Netherlands really flourishing. And, uh, you know, Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens was working during that time. Um, all of the great still life painters like uh, Rachel Reich and uh, Jan van der, um, uh, Jan van Huysum and... Uh, they were all working at that time. It's just, um, so I would say when you go to university and you get taught how to paint, they're typically teaching you what's now called the Flemish seven layer method. Um, so since that period, that region and that period was kind of known around the world for their t amazing technique in and around 1630 up through 1700 that's really where the Flemish method became popularized so so uh, yeah go to Google and check out the Flemish seven layer method um, and uh, oh of course Rembrandt I, I didn't say Rembrandt Rachel Rausch uh, Jan van Huysum Rembrandt um, Peter Paul Rubens uh, they, you know just that's it was this time also when artists started to paint um, with merchants as their patrons, not simply the church uh, giving uh, patronage, but um, it was a real time of, of commercial um, enterprise. So you have a lot of um, the Venetian merchants commissioning uh, artists. So there was a, a real um, boom in, in art practice because it was historically it was quite expensive and difficult to maintain a studio so you did see a quite a boom in that period um, of course the great uh, Vermeer was in that same period as well um, yeah I really saw the technique it was probably the height of uh, technical painting um, was was during that time and into the 1700s with the Baroque and Romantic uh, periods, but um, yeah, I would say, I would say that maybe the the, the latter half of the sixteen hundreds. Can I do a tutorial on a realistic face? Uh, no, I can't really because, um, so I have all of them, all of the parts individually done, but uh, I, I only have 
well, maximum three minutes, but realistically, nobody watches for three minutes. It's it's about a minute is uh, how long people want to watch. So um, I can't do a realistic face in a minute. It's, uh, it just, it's doesn't happen. So I can certainly do tutorials on how to do a whole realistic face, but um, that's more like a YouTube thing. So, but I have all the individual components. I have eyes, I have the skull, um, hair, I have one for hair, I have nose, I have lips, uh, ear, I have all those things um, individually, so. So happy I found you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the rose. Yeah, hello, Art Marcel. Thank you, Mama Bear. Artist and historian. Uh, no, I'm just an artist. Just an artist, not a, not a historian. I just um, happen to know a little bit about those periods because I, um, I, I'm interested in the art of that time as well. So when, in order to really understand the art, you have to try to understand what was going on at that time so maybe there's a certain style of painting that that was popular well why was it popular oh wow okay there was a war going on what was the war about and then you could just kind of fall into a wikipedia hole um you know and of, of all holes to fall into a wikipedia hole is not one of the worst ones so um yeah you just it's uh it's just information and it, that's a good thing if you can use it. Yeah, even three minutes would not be enough time. Like, it took me a, a minute and 40 seconds to do the eye. Um, so, yeah, even three minutes would not be good. For a realistic face, no, that's I could probably I could do a I could do a face, but uh, I couldn't do a realistic face. I can draw a realistic face in three minutes, but I can't do a tutorial in three minutes because I have to. I I can't just produce a product. I have to try to be able to draw it in such a way that I that other people would be inspired to try it themselves you know if you if i go too quickly or make it too hard then people may not feel inspired to try to try to draw art and the purpose of my whole tiktok account is to try to inspire people to embrace their creative side and and uh, maybe pick up a pencil for the first time or pick up a paintbrush for the first time um and uh maybe get to know some other people on the app and and uh yeah just share my story of art and what it's done for me and and hopefully um that it might help other people in the same way that art has helped me in my life so You'd watch it? Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. All right, let's go to the next one here. Kind of making some good progress today. Um, 
it's nice to be able to have uh, all of my colors set. I don't really have any surprises here. It's cadmium red and cadmium orange again. And later on, I'll be using some of that magenta and black for the shadows. So this one's gonna be kind of, just kind of a flat base here, so that's all gonna be lit. What are we painting? Uh, these are a kind of a fruit called a kwandong. Uh, they're native to Australia. And uh, this painting is destined to go to 19 Karen Contemporary Art Space. It's uh, the largest art gallery in Australia. It's in uh, Mermaid Beach in the, in the Gold Coast. And uh, that's a gallery that represents me, so sending them two paintings in January. This one with the finch. Uh, this is going to be a finch here. And uh, another painting with a lorikeet. Looks like a parrot, basically. Uh, I'm going to be sending them two paintings. And uh, yeah, that's that's what I have next on my, on my agenda. Um, after that, I have a charity auction that I have to paint a painting for. Uh, and that auction, I think, is in April, but uh, my painting is due in March. Um, and then I also have the Affordable Art Fair in New York next spring that I'll be doing some more digital photography for. Um, and so I have, I have that to produce. That might be a project for the holiday season. Since I'll be away from my studio uh, for a week and a half um, over the holidays, uh, but I will have a computer, so I might be able to get a lot of the editing and production done there. I'm adding the highlight now, and uh, I don't just want to do one white shape. I want to be able to mix it up and uh, kind of give the impression that there's a little bit more texture on this. So in terms of uh, brush, I didn't mention I'm using a zero round brush by uh, Meaden. This is a uh, fairly inexpensive brush you can get uh, you can buy them online uh, on through amazon for something like 15 bucks for a pack of 10. Um, it's the first time i i bought them actually i bought them a little while ago when my uh, when the pandemic first started and art stores were closed i got these off of amazon and they've lasted since uh well for for a while since mid 2019 20 uh, 20 um, but I painted a whole show with them so they're pretty good they do last
important to stand back from your painting every now and then or lean back uh, and try to look at it from a different distance. Sometimes what looks right from one distance may not look right from another distance. So having those different perspectives can really help you help you develop your painting vision. You know, if you paint a whole painting from sitting distance with your head one foot away, and then everybody looks at that painting from viewing distance four feet away, then they're not they're never going to have the same experience that you had when you painted it, even if you paint exactly the painting that you wanted to paint, it's not gonna be the same viewing experience because they're not getting a foot away. So that's something to keep in mind. You do have to back up and try to view your painting at, at the distance that other people will be viewing your painting. Ghost Kamig, hello. Thank you for the follows, everyone. And thanks for uh, tapping the screen. For those of you who have been tapping, we've just been, uh, we just passed 13,000 likes. So thank you very much for, uh, for continuing to like and share this live stream. It is appreciated. How many hours have I put into this one so far? Um, I'm not sure. Today, it's been maybe maybe two, two hours today. Um, and then another two or three before that. So yeah, let's say five hours of painting and then designing it, drawing it out. It's another few hours. So under 10, I'd say. I uh, really don't keep track of that kind of stuff as much as I should. Yes. Yeah, it's it's this is just about place. This is uh this is strictly for the owner. I mean, it's hers to sell obviously, but this is uh, a a piece specifically for the owner of that Australia gallery. I've been meaning to put some Australian flora and fauna into a into a painting. So I said once my once my solo show was done that I would do that. So yeah, this is uh one that This is one that uh I hope is I hope is well received where it's going to be. Um what is my opinion on digital art? Yeah, there's well, there's a I uh, that's a big question uh, because there are a lot of different kinds of digital art, right? So um, if you want to ask a more specific question, you can. But I'll just kind of ramble about digital art generally. Um, so first of all, let's talk about different kinds of digital art. If you use a camera, a digital camera like your iPhone or a DSLR. You're taking digital photographs. That is digital art as well. Now that's a very different kind of art than creating art from scratch in Procreate on your iPad or on Photoshop um, from scratch, where you start with a blank digital file and then draw 
Uh, and you can do a hybrid. You can import a photo and then draw on top of that. Uh, and then what you do with that photo as a digital file, you can go different ways with that. So um, I actually have a number of different digital work available right now. Um, so one of the one of the ways that I sell digital art is that I take photographs, I um, digitally manipulate the photograph in Photoshop, and then um, I send that file to the gallery I work with in New York City, and then they will print out those files in limited edition prints. Um, so I actually have a show on right now, and the additions are limited to five copies of each of the works um, and uh, and then they they use uh, archival paper and archival ink and they produce these incredible um, incredible quality limited edition prints so that's one way that I sell digital work the other way is purely digital um, and that is uh, through nfts Sometime do I mess up? Yes, all the time. Uh, thank you for saying you like my painting. Yeah, so I, I also sell NFTs, uh, and that's purely digital. You're selling the you're selling a digital asset, like a, a PNG or a JPEG or an MP4 or an MP3. You're selling a digital asset. And uh, so, given the fact that I do sell them, uh, I obviously I am in favor of them. Um, I think that you're going to see a real boom in digital art, specifically NFTs, NFT related. Well, you're gonna see NFTs increase everywhere, not just in art. Um, so, having said that, NFTs and digital art will never replace, in my opinion, never replace traditional art. Uh, it's a, it's not a either or situation. It's a it's a it's an as well as. So, just like uh, you know, a hundred years ago when photography was developed, and people people said that's the end of painting. Well, it wasn't the end of painting. It's the same thing now that NFTs are a thing. Um, people are saying, oh, that's the end of photography, that's the end of painting. Well, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's not an either or, uh, and it's not going to replace anything. It's just, it's, it's another way that we as artists can express ourselves. And I'm always for an, any method of creativity that doesn't harm anyone. So um, I think there are still a few um, environmental issues with NFTs that are that need to be worked out, um, in, in terms of environmental impact, still a f maybe a few issues need to be worked out, but as long as you can try to minimize those in your own practice, then uh, yeah, I'm in favor. I'm in favor of creativity. I'm on the side of creativity for sure. You like my painting? Thank you very much. Bye bye. What's an NFT? Um, an NFT is a is a digital asset, like a JPEG or a PNG file, or an MP3 or uh, like some kind of digital file that has let's call that the file, and uh, you have attached to the file a contract a smart contract and the contract is uses a piece of technology that makes it unhackable and um and, and makes it makes it uh, un uh, makes it completely transparent anyone can see it um and um and uh yeah so and and, and because you have this contract that anyone can see and it's unhackable then the the file becomes unique because it's got it's a one-to-one -one. one file equals one contract so this the whole thing together is the nft uh, and the piece of technology is on a platform 
or not a platform, but a, a, it uses a kind of technology called the blockchain. So that blockchain is completely transparent. Anyone can go to it and see. Um, so it's a kind of, it's, it's crypto art. So when you're on the blockchain, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's basically, it's a digital asset that can be traced back to the, to the creator and provides a record of all of the ownership and all, and all of the payments as well. Um, transparent and unhackable and unique. So yeah. Uh, and it stands for non-fungible token. Fungibility is a characteristic of a thing that means uh, it can be replaced easily. Like uh, if you have a $20 bill, it doesn't matter that it's a specific $20 bill. That doesn't matter. What matters is that it's 20. So uh, a bushel of wheat is fungible. A, a pound of gold is fungible. You can replace it with another pound of gold. It's gonna have the same value. Uh, paintings are non-fungible. You can't replace it. It's, it's a unique item. So NFTs are basically a way to make JPEGs and, and audio files. It's a, it's a way to make them unique. And why do you want to make something unique? Well, if something's unique, it uh, can increase in value because then it can have a unique owner. And that's the reason why a painting will always be worth more than a poster of that painting. Yeah, yeah, I don't think NFTs can replace painting, but it's amazing to, that there's another opportunity. And then the other, other, another cool thing is that um, resale rights are built into that smart contract. So if I sell you a painting... Um, thank you so much, Shane. I appreciate that. We're at 14.9 thousand. Um, resale rights. That's something that artists typically don't don't uh, enjoy. So, you know, somebody really famous like Gerhard Richter in Germany, he famously made uh, 200 paintings, I think it was, available for $200 each. Um, and he's, I mean, he sells paintings for millions. And, um, and when people bought them, they put them back on the market for very, very high prices. Um, and he doesn't get any of the resale rights. But with NFTs, you do. You typically get about 10%. You can write any percent back into the smart contract, but typically it's about 10%. It goes back to the artist. So that's really great. But yeah, it's not a, it's definitely not a fad. It's not something that's going to go away. NFTs are here to stay, and they're they're already accepted in the art world. Both Sotheby's and Christie's, the major art world auction houses, have already both had auctions with NFT art and NFT artists. So, when the major world's major auction houses have anointed that medium uh there yeah there's no turning back it's definitely a thing um i think that's going to be the last one i think that's it nine o'clock uh here in my part of the world so uh yeah coming along we're getting there Thank you all so much uh, for joining in uh, this this other this next this uh, last live stream here. I'm gonna maybe squeeze in uh, another one before I head away uh, on Friday morning for my holiday. Uh, if you are interested in having any of my art on your walls, please do check out the link in my bio uh, or go to markliamsmith.com. It's the same as my username. MarkLiamSmith.com. I sell prints. I have over 40 different paintings available in print form. And um, 
They start at 25 bucks. If you'd like a piece of original art, I have um, a solo show on right now at Gallery Yoon. Uh, link again in my in, in my bio. And I also have a photography show on in New York right now with Treat Gallery. And link in my bio on that too. So uh, yeah. What country do I live in? I live in Canada. I live just outside of Toronto. Um, yeah. Have a uh, wonderful night, everyone. Happy painting, and we'll see you in the next one.